a story about the attitude of individuals to the life of the liquor family. All the war years the director of the reserve was Alexei Dutrievich Cherstkov. An engineer by training, a great connoisseur of wildlife, an excellent hunter and a wonderful person. He was faced with the difficult task of protecting the vast, inaccessible territory of the reserve, practically without observers. At Hulk Wardens, the duties of observers were performed by the wives of their husbands who had gone to the front. There were only women in the scientific department. And transport is only riding horses. Alexei Dutrievich devoted a lot of time to the residents of the village and especially to the youth. He would often come to our little club in the evenings and, by the light of a kerosene lamp, would tell us about the situation at the front. Sometimes in a good mood, I played the guitar and sang romances. He knew and loved music. Throughout the war in our village there was no electricity, no radio, no store, and the newspapers reached us on the 10th, 12th day after they were published. We did not have any ration cards for the entire war, we grew bread ourselves and received flour according to wartime standards. But, despite the almost complete absence of men and other difficulties, he managed to control the territory of the reserve, the southern border of which was guarded by border guards. For a little over three years of his work, he traveled almost all of its territory. He made four trips to the Abakan Cordon, a hot spring and along the Badui River Valley to the southern border with Tuva. Each time, leaving for the Abakan Cordon, he included in the expedition one of the scientific workers and one or two elderly hunters. He took five kilograms of salt with him to replenish the supply at the cordon and always said, For a of, maybe we'll lure him out of the tiger with salt. He hid the salt in a cache, which Likov knew about, and left a note in which he described the events, insisted on leaving the Tega and said that the cordon was at his disposal. But, as time has shown, Likov was never at the cordon, everything was whole. Later, I think in 1950, we accidentally found one of Cherstvov's notes in the pantry. During his next trip to the Abokan section, he left everyone on the cordon, and himself in a boat climbed 6 kilometers, 10, 15 up the river, but nowhere did he find any traces of a person. But, as he said, the beasts are everywhere darkness. On their return from their last trip in September 1945, when there were about 8 kilometers to our village, a rather large bear unexpectedly jumped out onto the trail about 70 meters in front of them. For a while, he stopped, as if looking at people, and almost immediately, like a tank, rushed at them. First rode in front, and, as those who followed him said, he instantly pulled off the carbine from his back, and, as he was in the saddle, fired offhand. The bear rolled over over its head and remained lying on its back, slowly opening its paws. Having twitched the bolt, the director fired again, but there was no need, the first bullet hit right in the forehead. A few seconds later, in the ensuing silence, Alexei Dutrievich looked around and, jumping off his horse, smiling, asked. Are you alright? Go say hello. All three carefully dismounted and even more carefully approached the defeated beast. People were saved by his art of the arrow, otherwise the bear would have disheveled everyone. Terst said that after the war he would definitely find Likov and move him to the cordon. In November 1945, he handed over the cases and left for his native Moscow. Later, the Council of Ministers sent him to Novarkusk, where he was appointed chief engineer of a plant for the production of electric locomotives. With one of the former employees of the Enkv Chizikov, who took part in a trip to the Abokan cordon in 1947, we lived in the same city and sometimes met. Our last meeting took place somewhere in the mid-70s. We sat for a long time in the park and remembered those times. Here, many years later, he practically repeated the same words as then. He said that Lick of himself did not pose any danger, he was not involved in anything, and he did not live on the territory of Gornialtai, so they were not really interested in him. His main fault was that he took away his family and thus deprived his children of absolutely everything, and there was no order to allegedly liquidate Likov. The Lykov suffered anyway, Evdokim was killed, but in this case neither the authorities nor representatives of the authorities had anything to do with this. This murder was on the conscience of the workers of the reserve, who, as he said, covered themselves with the fact that Evdokim allegedly resisted. 
Whether he told me everything or not is hard to say, but in my opinion, he was not dissembling. Many of the deeds of those distant now years have gone into the past and are already covered with the ashes of time. In general, the authorities dealt with the question of what to do with the Lick of family, and in 1951 it was decided to find them, settle them in the reserve cordon and enroll Karpasipovich as an observer. And this work was entrusted to the management of the reserve. But we already knew about this in 1951. Another thing surprised me. Chizikov told me about one person who was interested in organs at the time. It turns out that I knew him and told him about it. Chizikov laughed and replied that it is good that you didn't he know about it, you can't he know much then. This man was not guilty of anything, therefore they did not touch him. These are the vicissitudes of fate. In essence, now, when I describe the events of those distant now years, it may seem to many that then there was nothing to do but what to think and talk about the Lykovs, to hold meetings, to argue what to do, what to do, etc. In fact, life went on as usual. The Lykovs were rarely remembered, and he practically did not interest anyone. And if not for the reserve, no one would have remembered about them. One of the residents of the village of Kilinsk, where the Lykovs' relatives live, told me. Nobody drove them into the Taiga, they left themselves, and, thinking, added, like of martyrs, they lived in darkness and will go into oblivion. But here it can be argued that the Lykovs, with their hermitage, their way of life, in the complete absence of contact with people, attracted everyone's attention. The case is truly unique. They learned it about them in other countries of the world and, in hot pursuit, wrote a lot, talked a lot, but gradually the passions subsided and calmed down. Time will pass, and they will be forgotten, and there will be no one to remember. Other global events are replacing, the affairs of bygone days. And all this will remain in literary sources and in archives. People reacted with understanding to the tragedy of the Lick of family and sincerely tried to help these people in some way, at least somehow, this is characteristic of the Russian soul. And the fact has come true. The Lykovs were helped and are still helping Agafya Karponna, who remained alone in this life. The world is not without good people, and thank God. The main thing now is to arrange life in long-suffering Russia so as not to be afraid of tomorrow, and the most important thing is that people do not have the desire to drop everything and go wherever they look. It is in Russia that there are all the possibilities that exist in order to ensure a healthy lifestyle for everyone without exception and so that an abundance of everything reigns throughout Russia. In conclusion, I would like to say that I deliberately did not touch upon the issues of the inner life of this family. Almost everything has become a thing of the past, and now it would not be entirely correct on my part to stir up this past, to look into their personal lives and, probably, it would be incorrect. Their internal affairs are the same as those of most families of Russian peasants. The Lykovs, like many peasant families, whether they were old believers or worldly ones, were hard-working, honest, but most importantly, they loved their land and, as I said, were happy for their motherland, Russia. They had all the qualities of the Russian character. The Lykovs were not tainted in anything. The only thing that distinguished them was their life path. It would be unfair to blame Karpasipovich with his firm character now for the correctness of the decisions he makes, just because this question can be asked to everyone, and whether the decisions were made right there, above, in those distant now, in relation to the majority of the population of the state. But everything is a thing of the past. The main thing is not to repeat the mistakes now, of which they have piled up so many that you cannot count. Please share this video on your social networks, using the buttons under the video and subscribe to the channel. I ask you to go and watch other videos about Agafya Lykova, which you can see now on the screen in the end screen savers. There are a lot of rare and interesting facts about the hermit. Thank you all for watching.